All right, you heathens, get ready for the greatest idea ever. <gasps> Any questions? Yeah. Before we get to today's show, though, I have to ask, do you like free things? Do you like winning? Well, today's your lucky day because I'm partnering with today's sponsor, Slick Deals, to bring you sweepstakes you won't want to miss. Four lucky people who click on the link in the description will be entered to win one of these fabulous graphics card prizes. And let me tell you, these are all better than what I'm using, so I'm actually a little bit jealous I can't enter this. To make sure you're entered to win, all you need to do is click the link in the description, which will take you to a landing page for the Slick Deals browser extension. Click the button to install the browser extension, and then a new window will open that will ask you to make a Slick Deals account. And that's all you gotta do. You just gotta click on my link in the description and make sure you have an account and are logged into it. Very important to note, this is only open to US residents. It's only open to participants who haven't already installed the Slick Deals extension. And this promotion will be available for four days after the video is uploaded, closing at 11.59 Pacific time. At that point, winners will be emailed, told you won, and then you get to pick out of the prize pool, and it is first come, first serve but there are tons of very good prizes here so don't you worry about that you can check out the full terms and conditions at the link in the description as well but aside from that i want to tell you about slick deals as a whole because it is a thing i've been using since they first contacted me a few months ago you've already heard in this promotion that it's very easy to install you basically just go to the link in the description but once it's installed you can basically go to any website you enjoy and slick deals will find both coupons for you to use during checkout and deals from across the entire site and i've found a couple really good deals through this like i said uh, last week i think this was still a really good example scott pilgrim vs the world very good game i found it for four dollars because of the slick deals extension so not only will you be finding great deals and coupons through this thing but you also might win a really nice graphics card and if you've ever built a computer before this is one of the things that costs a little bit more than some of the other things so uh very good idea check this out and please enjoy the rest of the video. Hello everybody, I'm Garrelus64, and welcome to Sonic Rush 4. That's right, I said it, what are you gonna do about it? I'm gonna be real with you guys. Dimps gets a lot of hate for their work on Sonic, and I'm not sure why. They have a catalog of really strong titles that each might have little things that I can't get behind, but overall, I don't think anyone can say with a straight face, with a lineup like this, that Dimps shouldn't be working on Sonic. Hell, they even made the best version of Sonic Unleashed. I expect nothing but angry comments on this video after that, but I can take it. Bring it on. I mean, they make a duo of underwhelming games, and suddenly that's what people remember them for? I guess Sonic fans operate on a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately as opposed to what-have-you-done-for-me-as-a-whole type deal. But I'm sure we also totally understand one or two things souring the reputation of an entire thing. Uh, you know, the Dark Ages were a thing. Regardless of how against dimps people are these days, Sonic Generations 3DS is actually a better game, in my opinion, than the console version in some areas. Not the entire thing. Definitely not the entire thing. But please, let me explain that before I make any more ludicrous statements and, you know, you, you start coming to my house with, like, an angry mob or something. The biggest 2D elephant in the room is obviously the gameplay. There is no 3D modern Sonic here. It is an entirely 2D adventure just with a classic and modern twist. Or should I say a rush twist? Because aside from the trick system, which is still gone, big RIP in the chat for the trick system, please. Basically everything from the previous rush games is back. That's cool. I'm happy. Though one thing I don't like about this is that neither of the characters have a complete move set from the get-go. Both of the Sonics learn a new move throughout the course of the story, and let me tell you, this game is not very long, so some of the earlier stages end up feeling a little bit less enjoyable than they might have been otherwise if you just had the move set from the beginning. Modern Sonic learns the stomp, which he could definitely already do, and Classic Sonic is taught the homing attack. My theory on this is that Sonic is trying to Marty McFly himself out of existence so he doesn't get burned by any new games in the future, but look around the corner, there's Lost World, here it comes, oh my gosh! Classic's homing attack in the console version is a bonus for collecting all the red rings, but here it just sort of becomes a part of the level design. It also feels slightly different than modern Sonic's homing attack, but it's fine. Like, I mean, I don't think it was really necessary, but it also wasn't necessary for Dimps to nail the feel of the classic Sonic gameplay more than Sonic Team did on the console version. But wouldn't you know it, they went and did it anyway. Thank you, Dimps. For real, this classic Sonic is much closer to how he should feel. Do you guys remember the story in Sonic Generations? Is it me? Or is that place we were just in awfully familiar? That pink water makes me really nervous for some reason. We're, we're traveling, traveling through, through time, time and space! space. If you had 
answered what story, you are exactly correct. That's the point I'm trying to make. The 3DS version does try to add a little bit more spice on top of things, sort of like Colors DS did, but it doesn't do a ton. But you know what? Even a little bit more is nicer than the bland, mild chicken wing that is the console port. My main complaint with both versions of this game is that they had a gold mine of opportunity with a time travel plot, yet they really didn't do anything unique with it. Sure, they had the levels and the bosses, but this was the moment that they could have returned to so many key places in the series and had like some weird meta commentary on what they were doing before as opposed to what they're doing now. It's sort of like how they wasted the opportunity again in Forces and Mania because they could have done literally anything and the explanation was easy as because Phantom Ruby. Seriously, I would love to talk to the writers of these games because like unless they're under some really strict guidelines, like why aren't we getting fun things? Instead, we get like two cutscenes from inside actual levels where they either show Eggman getting kidnapped or make a one-off joke about Tails drowning or whatever, who cares? And then everything else just happens in white space. Boring. Very, very boring. The 3DS version, like I said, has a bit more spice, even if it's just fleeting moments. The characters actually acknowledge the locations they're traveling through at first, but it kind of stops towards the middle. But even so, it's still more thought out than what we have in the other version. Look, they even talk directly about the bio lizard after they beat him up, and it's like, what more could you want? Oh, a real story? Yeah, okay, well, I mean, I got you covered whenever I decide to upload another part of that. Other than that stuff I already mentioned, consider the ball drop, because they then go to hit, like, the exact same beats as the console one, and then... You know, they're even missing some of that, so whatever. Sonic's friends also seem to be entirely absent from this version, so that leads me to believe they all perished in the destruction of Eggman's Interstellar Amusement Park. Rest in pieces, Charmy. You know, between this and the 8-bit games, I feel like a bit of a broken record when I say, this game begins with a Green Hill level. In fact, it is THE Green Hill. As soon as you start a new game, Classic does his thing, gets intercepted by the Time Meter, proceeds to eat all the time, sending Classic to white space. Meanwhile, Modern Sonic arrives to his party way earlier, before the duo is kidnapped by the Time Meter and dropped into the opposite of Sonic Colors. Modern Green Hill then goes by in an instant, but it's here where you notice that this switches things up from the console version immensely. None of the level design, gimmicks, or sound pieces are copied over from the console version, even though it's the same location. It really makes this feel like a nice, fresh experience, even though it's Green Hill for the hundred millionth time. Instead of Chemical Plant showing up next, we are introduced to this game's other strong suit. Every single level aside from Green Hill has been changed. There's even one special location that I can't wait to talk about later, but talk about going above and beyond. They could have easily just done the exact same stage with new layouts, but... Nah, we're striving for game of the year every year over here. Casino Night is easily more of a favorite of mine than Chemical Plant. In fact, I don't really like that place. It makes me anxious. Classic Sonic stages in the Classic Era are actually pretty close recreations of the original stages, while modern zooms through a whole new world. But this stops being the case once we get to the Dreamcast and GameCube era. New to this stage, Modern Sonic comes across these gigantic roulette tables that make me wonder if the age rating for this was affected at all since, haha, <laughs> gambling bad. To be fair though, who cares? I could look at this all day. It's a perfect addition to this level. Next up, it's Mushroom Kingdom Zone. Mm-mm, part of a balanced breakfast. This stage is beautiful and I love it. It's one of my all-time favorites in the entire franchise and seeing this sort of reminds me of that video by Blob Van Dam that came out like a year before Generations even hit the scene except this is an actual playable thing and uh, that one just looks like something I want to play. Like really, really badly. Seriously got me feeling like Wily e. Coyote running into a tunnel with this thing. The modern stages continue to be better than the classic stages though and I guess that's another thing it has in common with the console version. I especially love this 3D rail grinding section. It's times like this I remember how fantastic some of these early 3DS games looked when you'd flip the 3D setting on for a couple moments. That is, if you could get the head tracking to actually keep working. New 3DS XL is where it's at, homies. Now, can I tell you something else I love about this game? You know how this is a celebration of Sonic's history? Well, there was one special stage that they flat out ignored. That being, why, the special stages, of course. You really should have seen that one coming. Even though Generations 3DS seems to have the easiest special stages in a while, I still appreciate them being here. All you need to do to access them is beat Acts 1 and 2 in a zone, and then select it from the menu. They opted this time to copy and paste Sonic Heroes special stages, complete with a great remix of that familiar track, and thankfully, instead of being ball-bustingly hard, they're cube-repairingly easy. I don't know, guys, I'd rather things just be fun than frustrating, you know? Also, them visuals, like, dang, man. Generations is just really good at taking old things and making them feel fresh and new again. Ring ring, did someone call for Metal Sonic? Because if you didn't, you should've. After the mirror cutscene plays out pretty much like it should, Dr. Robotnik 6 Chibi Metal Sonic on us, and instead of a true fight, you just race him through Casino Night Zone. You know, just like you did way back when. There's nothing wrong here at all. And if you're feeling it, ladies and gentlemen, let's all give a big hand for Big Arms. Yeah, the boss fight's actually a little underwhelming. Big Arms 
felt like a lot more of a threat in the original game, and uh, here it's kind of a cakewalk, but that's what happens when you turn a final boss into a first boss. Yet, somehow the Death Egg robot still felt pretty scary. The Dreamcast era is now upon us, and there are actually only two levels. Did I mention that this game clocks in at under two hours? But to make up for that, here is goddamn Emerald Coast! When I first played this, I probably got emotional seeing this level pop up. Sonic Adventure is my all-time favorite Sonic game, and Emerald Coast just goes right for the heart with its thousand degree glowing nostalgia knife. Both acts are now totally unique while referencing parts of the original stage here and there, which means whales, whales, and more whales. Classic Sonic even gets the usual little jump pads towards the end of his section, and it just made my heart swell up all over again. I can almost hear Takal's disembodied voice telling me how to use him. This stage, unfortunately, though, is also where Dimp's brain and bottomless pits start to pop up again, and uh, they will not be going away. Contrary to this next stage's title, this level is in no way radical. This is the worst level in the entire game, I swear. It's just really claustrophobic, and there are bottomless pits everywhere, and honestly, Radical Highway had a rough transition to 2D. Like, it just wasn't made for this. Like, you know that one section where you jump into, the, like, the ether, and there's, like, a bunch of wind gusts that blow you up, and then you go to the other side, because you can see the other side of the place, so you know you're safe. Here, you just jump off a platform and you gotta kind of remember that that's what happens in the level, but it's like, you could be jumping into a pit, and it doesn't really matter, like, it's just kind of poorly designed. I think 8-Bit Leafeon in my stream chat put it best when they said, this is the Planet Wisp of Generations 3DS. And let me tell you, that is not a compliment, folks. Dimps must have really known they messed up here, because after a quick rival fight with Shadow, Ha, <laughs> I bet it really hurt to see that, knowing Shadow will never escape being an assist trophy. Dimps graciously gifted us a gigantic confused lizard. Dude, I love this guy. I am so happy to see him again. And wouldn't you know it, this fight is even better than the original fight. For starters, you can't just fall into the chicken soup lake by mistake, and your movement options being different, i.e. the boost and slide, also make this encounter a lot snappier than what SA2 had to offer. Now, this Frankenstein of an era confuses me, because there's no real correlation, it's just Water Palace and Tropical Resort. Wait, Water Palace? Water Palace? Just yes, dude, a thousand times yes. Like, imagine what we could have had if they had gone all in on Sonic handheld generations. Like, I can't be the only one thinking that it would have been really cool. Just think about it. Bridge Zone, Gimmick Mountain, Gigalopolis, Meta Junglera, Egg Rocket, Music Plant, Twinkle Snow, Water Palace, Sky Babylon, and Tropical Resort. Man, it could have been amazing. Like, the remixes alone would have made this thing worth doing. If you got a dream roster of zones for Sonic handheld generations, let's hear it down in the comments. I want to hear what you guys like. Aside from that quick rant, I don't actually have a lot to say about this stage other than I love it. Even though it's a water level, this is THE Sonic water level. No others can compare. Finally, the final stop on our journey, we've got Tropical Resort, and this one also harkens back to its handheld iteration. You got them giant questionable totem poles and the burst wisp that handy dance Dandy DS exclusive formerly found in Sweet Mountain? Look, I didn't even play Sonic Colors DS when it came out, but this is some prime nostalgia bait right here. Oh look, it's my son! No! Sorry, son! Even though Heroes isn't represented by a level this time, it does get a boss fight in the form of Egg Emperor. Once you learn his patterns, this fight is 50,000 leagues better than the original, and I can prove that with science. You see, the original fight isn't fun at all, and this one is. Thank you, I went to college for this. From there, the cookie crumbles as you'd expect it to. The Sonics get beaten up, transform into their golden forms in a very underwhelming sequence compared to the last few games, and we're off to show that creep the real superpower of teamwork! Yeah! If you've heard anything at all about this game, my best bet is that you heard that the final boss fight is better than the original version, and it definitely is. The characters are much more mobile here, and the attacks come at you with a much better pace, so it's a lot easier to kind of fly through this thing and not be bored to tears like in the console version. I'd also say it's a bit harder because the Eggmen really don't want Modern Sonic to catch up, so there's a lot more unique attacks coming your way. Also, did I mention that there is no- Hey, look out! It's a homing shot! Yeah, it's another reason I could say that Dimps really outdid themselves here. The evil has been vanquished. With the Time Eater defeated, the gang gets sent back into the real world, and the classics depart soon after, supposedly creating that split timeline that everyone uses to justify Force's terrible writing. But I mean, too bad they don't say that in any of the games, so it's a headcanon and not actual canon. Modern Sonic and Tails, however, then head off to Sonic's surprise party, where I don't know if they find any of Sonic's friends or not, because, I mean, where were they? I mean, I mean, just kidding, they're, they're in that one image at the end, yeah, that totally doesn't count. Make sure to not skip the credits, though, because if you liked the ending medley in the console one, you gonna like it here too because it's a whole different grab bag of songs because you know it had all new stages well i mean all except one of course 
So this game isn't legitimately Rush 4, obviously you know that, but it still kind of continues the spirit of what we've been seeing over the last couple months in these videos I've been making. And unfortunately, after this, the 2D Sonic Boost games would sort of fizzle out of existence, and they haven't been seen since, at least at the point of uploading this video. Maybe in the future we'll see something else, but uh, it's kind of like the end of an era. At least we have the memories locked away in our hearts and minds, and of course, in this review series. It's been a blast reviewing all these games, but now we have to move on to the future, and things are looking a bit rocky. Let me set the scene for you. It's a crisp October day in the year 2013, and a new Sonic game is just released. Wii U owners all over the world, all 15 of them, me included, gear up for the newest Sonic game, and wow! What a stinker! Like, for real, this isn't Generations 2, what is this? Mario Galaxy except without all the good? Not long after that, a second version releases, and being the sucker I've always been, I pick it up, and... This was the version I actually played to completion. My exact feelings were pretty much summed up with a, uh, it's not that bad, and then it goes untouched for years, thus allowing my brain to soak up all the other people's criticisms of the game and slowly warp my perception of it, until I'm positive this is a mess of a game that can hardly even be called better than the Wii U one. But wouldn't you know it, like with most things in life, I was wrong. There's honestly a really short supply of things in this world that are worse than Lost World Wii U, and Lost World 3DS definitely isn't among those things. Dimps, once again proving they're the MVPs of Sonic, actually managed to take everything from the Wii U version and provide a much more entertaining product, and it's not even funny how much better this one is. Perhaps most importantly, much like classic Sonic in Generations 3DS, Dimps decided to go ahead and make the controls worlds better. When a game is fun to control, it automatically becomes a strong contender for my favorite games of all time list, and after a few seconds of gameplay, I was shocked at how good it felt to move Sonic around the tutorial area. Gone was the stiffness of the Wii U version, for even things like the spin dash were totally fixed and now make for a great way to speed through sections as long as you have good enough reflexes for it. This already gets rid of one of my biggest complaints with the Wii U version, but I wouldn't be praising it this much if that was the only fix included in this product. You remember that whole parkour system that Sonic Team made into the main gimmick of this game? Yeah, me neither, because the main version basically relegated it to one or two wall running sections and then it turned into a glorified ledge grab mechanic. Over here in Dimpsland, however, they made an effort to have it appear consistently throughout the entire game, and it's utilized a lot better than the console version, but of course that's not saying much because the console version didn't utilize it at all. Whoop whoop! Usually when you introduce a gimmick like this, it's, you know, good to actually use it. Otherwise it turns into what the cool kids call missed potential, and then people never shut up about it as if the potential for a game to be better means that I should respect it more as a whole. Real talk? No. Just no. Like, I'm not going to think about how good something could have been. I'm going to judge it on what is included in the $60 package I purchased, because that is all that matters. On the opposite side of things, something the Wii U version did have a lot of was this totally not tubular, tubular level design. God, that was a mess. It made every single level so boring, bland, and samey. I guess it's a bit hypocritical to say that they shouldn't have explored this gimmick as much as they did after scolding them for doing the opposite, but they went hard with the bad gimmick instead of the one that could have actually made for a really fun experience. Case in point, the 3DS version has a lot less of this bleh and a lot more inspired and creative level design as a result that still has plenty of space for the player to run around and make most of the abilities that they gave you. And that's because they didn't feel the need to make every single level into a sausage that's stuffed with bad level design and sadness. And if you're about to say that it's not a bad gimmick because Galaxy was able to pull it off and do really well, I'll give you that it works better there for sure. But I honestly wasn't a big fan of it there either. I honestly vastly preferred the more traditional levels in Galaxy as opposed to the gravity experiments. Now, since I've been overly positive for this entire video so far, I uh, thought I would maybe move into the negatives because I'm pretty good at talking about negative things. Though people do get angry at me when I'm negative about Blue Hog Game. You know, I've been hearing that Sonic fans don't like it when they throw 2D sections into the 3D game. That's something I think we can all agree on. Isn't that crazy? We're all on the same team this time? What the- what? What? Huh? For as much as I like this version of the game, I've gotta say that no matter which one you pick, the 2D sections are very, very... Bleh. In my experience, in these more cramped areas, Sonic moves way too fast to react to half the stuff that's coming your way, and your only alternative is to let go of the run button and make the game play unbearably slow. This might be a good option in the puzzle levels like the Pyramid and Desert Ruins, but as a whole, these just don't really feel as optimized for Sonic's controls as the rest of the game does. At least they're pretty reserved with the 2D levels for when they pop up, like I don't even think there's one in every single world, but I could be wrong on that. Let's see, more negatives... Oh well, uh, here's a pretty obvious one. Forced motion controls? A classic Nintendo move pulled by Sega. Look how far we've come from the console wars, guys, this is so cute. 
The Wisps return in this game, much to everyone's confusion, and while many of them are fine, uh, like, why do we need to tilt the console to work this little boulder wisp? The circle pad would have been just fine and more accurate, thanks. Really, nothing against the 3DS's gyroscope. I mean, hell, in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask 3D, that's the best way to aim, but my problem lies with dropping this control scheme into places where it easily could have been done otherwise. One is a luxury, and the other is a hindrance. And you know I'm gonna mention those special stages. My god, I- I- what? I- I think I'm comfortable calling these things the worst in the entire franchise? Like, who's with me on that? Like, I applaud that this game has a more direct route to obtaining Super Sonic, as, you know, in the console version, you need to collect all the red rings, this one you just need to get the emerald. But I will never suffer through these unless someone ends up holding me at gunpoint. Man, what a strange request that would be. If you could maybe just turn Sonic around without physically having to spin yourself in a circle, maybe they'd be a little bit more tolerable, but these are a nightmare. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to tie my spine in a knot because some masochist over at Dimps thought these weren't so bad. The story is also garbage because of the deadly disappointments and Diet Bowser over there, but I think I've talked enough about that in the past if you remember. So let's move on to the stages so I can gush about them and also complain and, you know, also throw in witty one-liners here and there because that's just sort of the formula. We are surely in for a treat now. Windy Hill Zone? Windy Hill Zone? I still don't really know the right pronunciation. English is stupid. But Windy Hill kind of makes more sense, right? This is what we're using to fulfill our Green Hill quota this time around, and the tutorial level and first level provide exactly what you need to learn how to play the game. As, you know, they, they should. Whether it be learning about the enemies you need to stun with your new Sonic Boom attack versus homing attacking them right away, or figuring out how the parkour works for later, there is never a dull moment. Well, until you get to the underground stage, that is, because this is the point where a lot of people swear this game off. And probably also swear just in general. I, I, I don't know, I'm not your dad, I'm not gonna tell on you. A lot of stages in this game go on for a good chunk of time, and people seem to really dislike that. But there were only one or two stages where I really felt like that was a problem. I mean, otherwise, it just means there's more to play, and why would that be a bad thing if I'm having fun? Remember, just because they give you 15 minutes to finish the stage doesn't mean it's actually going to take that long. Before you're able to jump over to the next world, the best of the worst, Zaz, gets in your way. And let's just get this out of the way right now. All the bosses in this version are totally different than the console version, except for the final boss. Isn't that just dandy? Because, you know, some of the console boss fights kind of bite a little bit. The gist of all of them, though, still kind of revolves around the multi-hit homing attack, which I don't really care for. It's sort of awkward to get it up to full strength for the bosses, but you could always just spam it instead. The fights will just last a little longer. Desert Ruins brings us two firsts. Our first mandatory wisp, thankfully without motion controls, and our first level that's a tad too long. Here we meet up with the Asteroid Wisp, and it's used to devour the tornadoes that block Sonic's path. I feel a little bit bad for him, though, because I wouldn't wish sand in the mouth on my worst enemy. The Asteroid Wisp also makes short work of even the largest foes once your ring of destructive energy grows big enough. The sand conveyor belt level is just a huge annoyance from start to finish. You start off in this section where you have to fight to reach the end of it to hit a couple switches, and that takes like six minutes if you're me. And then you think you're coming up on the end when you finally hit these rings, but no, the stage just keeps going for another three minutes anyway, and uh, there's not much I can consider fun throughout its entire runtime. Zomom decides to oppose you here, but much like Sonic Colors DS, using optional wisps provided to you in these fights can melt any Zeddy faster than a game reviewer can say a rough transition to 3D. Tropical Coast is the water and apple juice world. The Drill Wisp returns and makes navigating underwater sections an absolute blast. A Sonic Blast? Oh, wait a minute, I can't say that anymore because that game was terrible. And I bet you're wondering where the apple juice comes in, right? Well, uh, there's one stage where you end up pushing apples around for six minutes to raise the height of the platform you're standing on, and I've heard people call this one really slow and boring, but I honestly really liked each little challenge room that you had to push these apples through. They just could have probably made the pushing mechanics a little bit less obtuse. Other than that, the only crime this level commits is making me thirsty. How dare you. Master Zix boss fight might be part of a balanced breakfast, but it's also fairly unbalanced because the 2D controls are horrible here. The mix of the gravity mechanic and their subpar 2D formula is a terrible combination. You end up not knowing what direction to hold half the time because you keep moving forward, then you'll just stop dead in your tracks and you'll have to figure out it's like you have to push down or left or up or... I, I'm, you're pushing something, you're pushing my buttons. That's basically the hardest part of the fight, aside from waiting around for something to happen. Make sure to grab that drill wisp and end this thing quickly. Master Zick really needs to get back to Dagobah so we can train some guy in the way of the sonic force. Is Might as well wrap it up now, that's probably the best we're getting out of the script. Frozen Factory has a pretty bad reputation amongst the people who've played this game, and it doesn't offer the skating gameplay from the Wii U version, which is a shame because they probably would have made it pretty fun here, but instead, they offer a very familiar Sonic trope. 
snowboarding. And this ain't your Sonic Adventures snowboarding, no way, no how. This actually turns into a really challenging section. When you're first introduced, it's a calming little jaunt through a winter wonderland, complete with a trick system. Praise be to Dimps for bringing back the trick system. But fast forward to several minutes past this bit, and you come face to face with a gauntlet of a stage that might be the longest in the entire game. You got your death-defying evil Knievel stunts. You got your surplus of lives thrown around the game because they knew it'd be hard and you'd be dying a lot. You've got your cool little cinematics at the end of the whole thing, so you feel like a really cool dude that's doing cool things with your life. That's cool. I love it. It's cool. No pun intended, pun entirely intended, whatever. And of course, you can't forget everyone's favorite stage, the snowball level. Just like the fruit stage, you end up rolling things around, but this time it's snow, and each time you roll it, it kind of amasses more snow and gets bigger, so you can fit them inside holes in the ground, resulting in paths opening up for you. Now, if that explanation sounded boring and slow, that's uh, to match how the stage plays, because uh, there is not one second of the stage that's actually enjoyable. I think it was the only one where I wasn't having fun. If it was like half the length that it is, and it didn't ask you to do the exact same thing a hundred times over, maybe it would be a little bit better. Now comes the worst of the deadly dumpster fires, Xena. Man, I hate these characters so much. Xena constantly expels all the hot air from inside her head, which forces Sonic backwards. To wound the Zeddy, Sonic has to homing attack her snowman, releasing a lightning wisp, and then use it to eviscerate her little snow drones, so you can then use them as a pathway up to Xena herself. This one might be a little finicky, but I love the concept of it, and really anything is better than the original one. Continuing along the new Super Mario Bros. theme trend, it's time for a forest world. Silent Forest is definitely the most varied in terms of gameplay styles. Act 1 makes heavy use, pun entirely intended, again, of the Grey Quake Wisp's ground pound ability. Act 2 is a rail grinding section, sort of like Sea Bottom Segway, except a million times more engaging. And the third is Metal Gear Solid, but with more fast. Motion control bias aside, Grey Quake isn't terrible to control, as you're only tilting left and right instead of doing your best owl impression with your spine. Though again, the level could have been a little shorter, and I wouldn't have complained about it. Now about the sea bottom segue comparison, please put down your torches and just enjoy this stage. The reason I like this more than the Wii U one is because it feels like I'm a lot more involved in what's going on. From what I remember about the Wii U grinding stages, it's a lot of just sitting there doing nothing and waiting for things to happen, like minecarts coming at you and you jumping over them or dodging the occasional electrified rail. But in this one, you're constantly hopping back and forth dodging obstacles, and it doesn't feel like there's ever a dull moment, and it's got me feeling some kind of way, like I'm feeling a feeling long thought dead in my body, like, I think I used to call it enjoyment? Yeah, I, I crazy, I know, right? I think I also enjoyed the stealth section, but the jury's still out on that one. For now, let's just say it was okay. All those nice feelings go away when the boss loads up, though. Remember when I said owl earlier? I bet you thought that was just random word choice, but psych, that was actually foreshadowing. Zor and Owl also both only have three letters. Coincidence? Absolutely. Use your mandatory motion controls to find the real Zor, or destroy all the fake Zors and help him with his imposter syndrome, which I am positive that he has. Hang in there, dude. You're amongst friends. As long as my math skills haven't deteriorated as far as I think they have, I think I'm right in saying that so far we've defeated one, two, three, four, five Zeddy, and six comes after five, so it's time for everyone's favorite character, Big Papa Zavok. Sound the chat alarms. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna call him Zavok. You can't make me. Zavok doesn't really strike me as a demonic entity that could get into heaven, but here we are in Cloud World. Or is it a casino stage? Maybe he is the devil? Ignoring that 2D slog, my favorite level in this entire world is surprisingly enough the one with the motion controlled rockets. Just like Great Quake, all you need to do is tilt the 3DS left or right, and you make your way through these little obstacle courses that get more fun by the second. But they're still challenging because one hit sends you tumbling down to the cruel Minecraft below. How's it feel, Sonic? Hey. The mines on the other craft now. You can also use the rockets for their intended purpose and slaughter bad dicks with them. Justice has been served, Pufferfish. And so it's come to this. I went skydiving, and not Rocky Mountain climbing, because we're not doing that, we're just fighting a big, angry moron. And his fight honestly isn't that great, it's okay, but I, I sort of like the big Zavik encounter, even though it was just a carbon copy of the giant Bowser encounter from New Super Mario Bros. 2. What a shocker, something from Lost World feels like a Mario game? I bet no one has ever thought this ever, am I right? Like what? At least busting this idiot's health bar with the laser wisp does make me feel good. Hey, do you guys like Mega Man? Oh man, of course you don't. You only like Sonic. That was a silly question. But I was asking because Lava Mountain is a boss rush. So go do all that stuff again. I'll be here when you get back, probably. Oh, then comes the Tails boss fight, of course. Oh, psych, gotcha. That doesn't happen.
And we've finally arrived at our destination at the end, and Dr. Eggman is the final boss, suddenly. Man, I wonder if the writers thought we wouldn't see this coming. Like, they're not gonna kill essential characters in a kid's game, unless you're a Zeddy, I guess. Because Sonic turned those fellas into Cheeto dust in the Wii U version. This one's pretty similar to the Wii U version, if I remember correctly, but I'm not sure if he has an insta-kill move there, too. I'm still a firm believer that no boss or player character should ever have those unless they're really well telegraphed, and this one is not. I had actually no idea why I died the first time. It happened while I was blinking. And then the game ends. Unless. Unless you're a pro gamer, that is, and you want to take on hard mode. The levels change color, and Dimps throw spikes everywhere. It's it's basically Dimps getting into the mindset of every six-year-old playing Mario Maker 2. Just, you know, throw a lot of challenging obstacles everywhere with no concern for player safety. It's all good. I played two levels of this, but I'm not going to check it out in its entirety for this video because it's just bonus, but I will be streaming a full playthrough of this mode over on my Twitch channel, which you can find in the description, along with the time and date that the stream will be happening. Be there or be there. Just be there. You should be there. So I'm sure those of us who aren't six years old probably remember this like it was yesterday. November 11th, 2014, the dawn of a new chapter. Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric and Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal were hitting shelves, and 18-year-old me was writing a 20-page paper for a college course I'd rather not talk about right now. My buddy Andrew knows what I'm talking about, up top! And of course I was working on the entire thing the uh, day before it was due, and that is still something I would do even to this day, I am a terrible procrastinator. But wouldn't you know it, on my way home from school that day, I went and picked up both of these games on pre-order. And they were basically going to be like my reward for finishing the essay, so, uh, everything was terrible that day, and I will never look at November 11th the same way ever again. I did end up getting an A on the paper, though. After playing Rise of Lyric for a resounding 45 minutes, I vividly remember a sense of despair creeping into my heart. So I, uh, went back up the stairs, sat on my bed, grabbed my 3DS, and popped in a shattered crystal. And then the feeling did not go away, and I've been locked in a constant state of disappointment to this very day. I'm sure that explains a lot. This day also happens to be the day that I've taken it upon myself to make a video about that game that I really didn't like and haven't touched for the last six years. And, uh, you know, I'm gonna level with you real quick. I was gonna make two separate videos, one about each game, but... I couldn't actually play Shattered Crystal for more than an hour and a half on stream without switching to something else out of fear of my eternal boredom, like, sticking further. What you're seeing here is me playing Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal over my Twitch channel, which you can definitely follow by clicking the link in the description, by the way, and uh, getting to the first mandatory blockade where I need to collect more items, and then promptly switching to Super Mario 3D Land. <laughs> I mean, there's a small difference in enjoyment between these two faces, right, if you can tell? I mean, I wouldn't want to be that guy, am I right? It's such a bad game design choice. For as much as I respect Sanzaru Games for putting a monkey in their logo like that, that's pretty- I like that, I like that they did that. When people say that this game is a little bit better than Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, I'm kind of like, yeah, there's a lot of things that are a little bit better than Rise of Lyric, like falling down the stairs. And surviving, of course. Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric is at least better than the cold embrace of death. So yeah, Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal is better than Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, but therein lies the problem. This game actually had a chance. A chance at what, you're asking? Uh, being entertaining. Because as far as I'm aware, this game didn't have any distressing development cycle where, like, the devs had to move their project onto a new console that didn't actually work for the project and get it to work at a strict time limit like the Wii U one had. This game just makes a ton of wrong decisions that are really boring and make this an unenjoyable experience because maybe they're just trying to be different than the mainline games? Didn't really work out very well, did it? I don't know if there's even one thing I can compliment about this game, which is kind of scary. Like, I mean, the visuals are very subpar, Knuckles looks like he got stung by bees, the levels are just aimless wandering incarnate, and some of the alternate pathways don't even lead to important collectibles, so you're just wasting your time. And speaking of time, you spend a lot of that in each level, to the point where I was like, what level am I in? Did I actually transition to the next level, or am I still in that other level? Because it's like, oh, when I take 12 minutes and nothing happens, it's like, what, what am I doing? What's going on? Throughout the levels I played, I also was forced to play these, I guess you could say, boring 
submarine stages with Tails' submarine toy thing. And I know some of you are going to say, like, oh, those aren't mandatory. And I'm going to say they're mandatory with a lowercase m as opposed to an uppercase one. Because, you know, maybe you go, yeah, I don't need to do that. And then you come to the next blockade and you're like, oh, you know what? If I had just done that one thing, maybe I wouldn't have to go back through the entire level two more times to find more things to do. So, like, it's kind of mandatory. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe you should have just let Tails play with his Toys R Us submarine. I, I don't know, dude. It's on you. Aside from the mandatory collecting things, the game doesn't control, like, poorly. Like, every single character controls exactly the same. They've got the homing attack, they've got the dash, they've got the inner beam, let's go. But also, they have character-specific moves that you need to use to collect things. Let's not go. I can at least get behind the fact that it's not like Donkey Kong 64, where every time you want to collect a character-specific object, you need to run all the way to the change barrel, and then run all the way back, and it's a huge detour. But, like... If the only praise I can give a game from 2014 is that it doesn't make the same mistake as a game from 1999, is that really a compliment or is that just like a duh, of course you don't do that moment? I don't like this game even a smidge, like not even one tiny little bit. Like when I put that game in a box six years ago and didn't touch it till now, I was completely justified in doing so because one of the worst things a game can be in my opinion is boring. Because games are supposed to be fun, They're supposed to be entertaining, right? So like when I have to retread through 12 minutes of level in your gross little Metroidvania wannabe game, uh, it's not what I call fun. But this game does have a sequel that I would never call gross. Usually for Sonic games, we're used to Sega not fixing problems between each entry because that's just not how Sega do. But Sega didn't make this game. Funny Monkey Sanzaru Games did. And let me tell you something, it really shows because every single problem I had with the first game has been erased and for every bad decision removed, at least two more good decisions have been put in its place like some kind of really cool Hydra or something. I am so beyond shocked to be saying this right now. But Sonic Boom Fire and Ice is actually one of the most enjoyable games that I've played for this marathon so far, and that is not- I'm not exaggerating. Like, if I wasn't actually playing it, which I was most of the time, like I just wanted to keep going, I was thinking about what would happen next. In a Sonic Boom game, I just- I couldn't- I just wanted- I, I'm leaving, I'm giving- I, I'm leaving, I'm out. I quit. As you can see, I don't understand it either. It's very strange. Gone is the awkward tone and weird pacing of the first game, and it's been replaced with the witty humor of the TV show that I liked so much that really should have got a season 3. So suffice to say, I laughed a lot while playing this game, which is not an experience that I have most of the time when recording these videos. And I've always been thinking that if you replace the characters in Sonic Boom with other characters, you wouldn't really, you know, be changing much. But in this game, it feels pretty Sonic-y. The story also feels pretty Sonic-y. It's like Sonic and his friends are like trying to stop these natural disasters or just this really bad weather. I don't know if they actually said natural disaster. It's just the script is a natural disaster, I can tell you that much. And while Sonic and Amy are trying to stop the first geyser from erupting, they suddenly get these like inexplicable fire and ice powers and you know, they don't burn and freeze alive, which is good. And then before long, Tails just ends up cannibalizing the powers they received for everybody else on the team, and I guess you gotta do that so you can have multiple playable characters and not get stuck into like one is more useful than the other kind of territory. But uh, that's pretty much the whole thing. Like, you gotta travel around all these cool islands and locations to stop these events from uh, causing natural disasters. But obviously there's gotta be a villain too, right? You see, there's this little robot named Defect in the story. And at first, I was like, oh, he's a little generic robot that's trying to stop you from closing the vents because Dr. Eggman told him to. But then you see his backstory, and it's like, okay, I'll let you keep the vents open like you deserve the world. I will, I will literally, I will do, I will die for you. And it also helps that this one's animated a lot nicer than the previous game, whether it be the in-game cinematics, which just, they just really look good this time. Like, they really made the most of the models and the animations. Or, of course the Sonic Boom cartoon looking ones, which always looked good. It's, I mean, I mean, it probably looks really good because it's stuck on a really low resolution screen too. 
But overall, it looks fine. That's what my point is. Though Knuckles got stung by bees again, I, I guess he just doesn't learn. Not only is it sonic -y in terms of plot, but also it feels sonic -y in terms of gameplay, because each level lasts like two to five minutes, let me check the script, but in that time, you're not hunting for collectibles like a dollar store Indiana Jones. I'm a dollar store commentator. <laughs> I gotta look at my phone for some of these lines. That sucks, right? Your goal instead is to race through the levels as fast as you can and collect anything you might see along the way. But, you know, nothing's mandatory. It's all good. Just play the game the way you want to play it. Have fun. It's a video game, remember? Have fun. That was, that was something we should have been able to do in the first game, I think. And it's not like there's no exploration either in this game, because there definitely is. And every single time you go off the beaten path and you're like, oh wait, I wonder what could be over there, you find something cool and out of the way and secret. And like, it's usually behind like a little platforming challenge and it's really snappy and then it sends you right back to where you were. It's good, it's just fun. Every single time I did that, it was fun. So I kept doing it. You see how that works? Like, when you force me to go out of my way to collect things, it's a chore. But when you say, hey, I bet you can't beat this platforming challenge, and then I do, then it feels like a reward. Then it feels like I'm playing a game and having a good time. Fuck yeah. It's a good game. Though one thing is, uh, you know, the more streamlined design and lack of really needing to collect anything kind of makes most of the other characters irrelevant. By the end of the game, I realized I was just playing as Sonic and I was completely fine. But obviously that also means you can pick your favorite and just play with them the whole time. So it's kind of like a win-lose win. I, I, you know, I, I don't really know. The other characters get to shine during the boss fights though, which are always a blast, not a Sonic blast. We are a Sonic boom today. Instead of the game going, here's your five characters, figure out which one you need to use for this part of the boss fight. The game goes, hey man, here's Sonic and his best friend Tails and they're gonna fight this boss together and they're gonna switch off automatically during the fight so there's no confusion about who you need to use and you're gonna have a really good time because apparently we put a lot of effort and work into this specifically and every single boss is fun and I was never bored even one time but there was this one time where Knuckles was doing this really weird animation that I don't understand but you know what he's having a good time still so who am I to judge? The game's also called Fire and Ice because you have Fire and Ice powers, and I forgot to mention that earlier because I'm a very messy script writer. But basically, it's not really that hard to explain. It's just fire powers will melt things and ice powers will freeze them. And I was kind of worried upon starting it up for the first time that that's all they were going to do with it because I haven't heard a lot of good things about this game, just, you know, some good things. But to my surprise, this is actually one of those games that gets better the longer you play it. Sure, they do the video game thing where it's like in the very beginning everything's really simple, they introduce new mechanics, but like by the last world, you're not just, you know, pressing the button in time with things coming at you, like, you know, you might want to press the fire button when some ice walls are coming up and it's like, okay, that felt good, but in the last world, you're like jumping around all these places and you're rapidly hitting L and R to switch back and forth between the two things and you're using the fire to light little charges to blow open new pathways and then you're jumping on like little geysers to like freeze them and use them as rails and it's just I couldn't believe it I still am awestruck by this game like I can't I want to play it again like I'm standing here talking about it and it's making me want to play it again, maybe on Twitch, which you could follow in the description like I mentioned earlier. <sighs> Not a shill if I'm talking about my own shit, right? <laughs> so the side play styles also make a reappearance in this game, but thankfully that's all they are. They are just side play styles. So, you know, you're walking around in the world map and you might come across Tails sitting in his dumb little boat or like standing there with his RC plane, submarine, it's not a plane. And uh, if you're like me, you turn around immediately and you walk back the other way to provide as much disrespect as possible. But if you're like someone else and you want to collect things for the sake of collecting, you can definitely play the submarine stages or the weird top-down shooter segments featuring Tails the Fox in his dumb little hovercraft thing. But, um, or don't. You don't have to. Thank you. Thank you for that. I really did not want to play those. I really owe John Sanzaru a lot for this game, so thank you, sir. You've done a great honor. <laughs> the tunnel levels and the race levels also return from the first game, and I apologize for not talking about them in the first segment, 
it's mainly because I didn't care, but it's also because every moment I spend thinking about that game shaves seconds off my life, and the stream was about an hour and a half long, so that's 5,400 seconds, so by my calculations, I might not have much time left. The tunnel levels in the first game were the things I had the most fun with, and uh, what it really boils down to is just Sonic Dash. So uh, let that sink in for a second. The full retail price 3DS game, the, the best part of it is a free mobile game that you can download um, on your iPad if you want to. Like, something's wrong with that, right? Like, it's not just me thinking that. And then the race levels, the race levels are pretty cool. Instead of being, like, just a random thing, you just race one of Sonic's friends and it's really funny and cool, you know, whatever, haha. It's like Eggman just shows up and it's total comic relief. He will just grab Sonic off the map and he will just take you to another level. It is actually really funny and actually really fun. Like, you don't actually have very much room for error in these races. Like, if you start messing up a little bit, these guys are gonna get pretty far ahead of you. And like, I didn't lose any of them, but there were moments where I was like, that guy is really far ahead of me. I should probably try and catch up right now, learn this level a little bit more. And I did, and it was fun, and apparently this is also part of the multiplayer mode, but, you know, it's not like I'm going to be able to play that in 2020 with anybody. <laughs> also, uh, Metal Sonic apparently has competition because this is definitely the best boy in the entire series. This game just blows my mind, man. Like, I've been gushing about this for, like, what, 15 minutes now, and it's like... Sure, maybe if you put it up alongside some of the greats of Sonic the Hedgehog, it's not, like, incredible, it doesn't hold up to those. But if you put it next to the Boom series, like... Hot dog, man. Like, are you, are you serious? Like, it hurts me to know that they put this much effort into this game. And made a really good game, and it's, like, I would love to play it more, or play a sequel. But it probably didn't sell well, because it was tied to the Sonic Boom brand. The show went down too, and that's the same reason, because who cares about Sonic Boom? It was bad, right? Maybe the show's bad too, I'm not gonna watch it. I'm putting it on Boomerang, I'm the executive director at Cartoon Network, making terrible decisions. It's just sad. It's just sad that they had something here, they improved the formula that much from the first one. And if they had gotten a chance to do another one, maybe they could have brought some kind of respect to the Boom brand, but like... Instead, Sega was just like, yeah, we're done, sorry. We're gonna go back to making mediocre games <laughs> instead of bad ones. Sucker. I just gotta say, you know, Sonic Boom, you weren't all bad. Just mostly.